next day was looming when an elderly woman showed up at the desk of Revenue Canada, and she said she required a thick stack of tax forms. Why so many, the clerk asked. Well, my son is overseas, she said. He asked me to pick up forms for the soldiers on the base. You shouldn't have to do this, he told her. It's the base commander's job to make sure that his troops have access to the forms they need. I know. I'm the base commander's mother. <laughs> That's one from the surely there's somebody else department. It's been said that the Gospel of Mark is a narrative that reflects two contrasting ways of life. According to New Testament professor David Rhodes, the two ways of life are saving one's life out of fear and losing one's life for others out of faith. The first way of life is, as it suggests, motivated by fear and is followed by people who seek to acquire power and status and keep it all for themselves. By contrast, the way of life made possible by faith is a life of relinquishing status and power in order to bring the good news of the kingdom to others. Jesus has been on the move well beyond Galilee by now, to the northwestern region, to the southeast. He was always spreading the boundaries of his mission. Like Billy Graham, he traveled in every direction. Now in chapter 8, Jesus and the disciples journey far to the northeast and enter Caesarea Philippi. And here in this distant corner of the countryside, Jesus turns to his disciples and asks, Who do you say that I am? As Peter was the first to respond to Jesus' call to discipleship, so now he is the first of Jesus' disciples to accurately identify his master. And when he pronounces Jesus as the Messiah, this is the first time any of his disciples have accurately and successfully comprehended Jesus' true identity. But Peter's declaration also opens the door for many profound misunderstandings about his identity. The hope for a Messiah promised <coughs> political deliverance in Israel. Hope for her full restoration of autonomous power. That's what Messianic hope was all about. And while Jesus had been gradually leading his disciples to recognize his title, he now has to begin the second and challenging stage of teaching them more. Yes, he is the Messiah, the Christ. And in verse 31, Jesus begins to lay out what lies in store for him because of this identity. And it's a forecast that his disciples are completely unprepared for, and as yet they are completely incapable of comprehending. Peter again acts as the leader of the group. Scripture says, he took Jesus aside, verse 32, as if he could quietly convince Jesus that he better stop talking this way, for his own sake and also for the sake of his followers, because he knew that they were going to be put in awful danger. You know, I, I was thinking about it this way. It could be like Peter, or one of us, <coughs> trying to rebuke LeBron James for floating the idea that he would spot Stephen Curry's team 10 points in the NBA All-Star game last week. How do you think that would have gone over? Well, I don't think it would have gone over real well, especially if it did it even well before the time clock started ticking. Or maybe it would be like telling a team of young basketball players to go easy on the other team. You know, let them take some open shots. Let them have some good time out there dribbling the ball. This is just about having fun, you might say. Uh-huh, what kind of team, what team of kids would take that from you very seriously, right? They knew if they did that, the other team would just walk all over them. Charlie Brown even says, when you gain everything, but losing ain't anything. And Jesus seems to be saying here that he's going to be losing. He invites his disciples to join him in losing. Be ready with your cross, he's telling them, because mine is coming because of what I'm going to be doing. And if you follow me, you're going to need 
respond to. The only thing is, Jesus knows that appearing to lose, as Jesus is speaking, is really not losing in God's kingdom. God's kingdom challenges and overturns all normal human assumptions about power and glory and about what is most important in our life. I like what David Luce says, and I'm quoting him here. He says, Peter could only imagine that grief, loss, betrayal, suffering, and death were things to avoid at all costs because they seemed to be quite literally God forsaken. If we're honest, we'll admit that we tend to be like Peter in that. We tend to favor strength, health, self-sufficiency, or at least the appearance of these things, over weakness, pain, and dependence. We feel the blessing of God, don't we? In our health, in our strength, in our, maybe not fat bank account, but at least one that's not overdrawn. How about our having things figured out on our own? We feel abandoned by God in times when we are sick and unemployed, or grieving, or struggling. We have to struggle with that. Where is God in all of this? And because we feel that way, we figure that anything that doesn't speak of health, strength, isn't really worth bringing up. So we tell each other we're fine when in reality we are often far from fine. We're just afraid to open up about what we don't feel that God is in. Or we don't feel that others believe God is in. Yet in the cross, God demonstrates that there is no place He refuses to go in the quest to love and redeem His creation. Even Jesus went so far to the point of identifying with the satanic movement of the revolutionaries who ended up being crucified on either side of the hill of Calvary in order to bring them and all of us salvation if we would believe. And one of those on one side of the cross of Jesus did this is a challenge to all of us as the church in every generation has to struggle to think and to live from God's point of view in the midst of the many divisions, in the midst of the many struggles and questions that we have to work through. And so the question for us today is, I believe, can we believe and in faith follow Jesus? Believing that God is most clearly and fully present with the suffering and the brokenness of our world, and even in our own brokenness and suffering. Maybe our call to take up the cross is the call, first of all, to be honest about our brokenness and entering into the brokenness of others. I remember I uh, had a conversation with, with an elderly neighbor who lived just down the street from us not too many months after Christine and I were married. And I suppose I was out walking the dog or some such thing, and I stopped to chat with her uh, as she was outside in front of her home. And she asked how married life was going. And I said, it wasn't without its challenges. And... <laughs> And I remember, Christine wasn't with me at that moment. <laughs> and I remember her encouraging way, her wise, wise beyond her years maybe even, her way of encouraging us and saying, you know, if any couple is really honest, you have to admit to working through some struggles. After all, two lives are coming together. And it's true for all of us. Each one of us has a story of one sort or the other. It might be for you a story of abandonment or betrayal, loss, loss of a child, loss of a parent unexpectedly, the end of a dream. There's so many possibilities that are as unique as we are and our stories are. But David Luce again says, I love his quote here that he had in his blog this week, he says, to live is to struggle, to hurt, and to experience loss and brokenness. And opening up about that is something that doesn't come easy. 
for fear of many times how it will be received. We fear we might be tossing our pearls before swine as it is. But embracing our brokenness is something that means also entering into another's pain and grief, which isn't very comfortable sometimes, especially if we aren't comfortable owning our own struggles. We follow the one who reveals, though, that nothing in this world can defeat the life of God. And with that hope and faith in our heart, what do we have to fear before moving forward, answering his call? Jesus knew his call was to go to the greatest pain of his people at that time. And he knew for that moment in that place and time it meant the cross in order that he might fulfill his mission as Messiah. Taking up our cross in the 21st century, I think, becomes symbolic for entering into somebody else's suffering. Going to those places where the hurt is so real and so felt in today's world. For example, the suffering of dementia. Or the suffering of addiction. The suffering of grief. And there's many more. Those are just some of the first ones that come to mind. Just as Good Friday isn't the end for Jesus, entering into another suffering, whatever that is, is not the end of our story either. The God of resurrection will bring life through our embrace in the form of loving action with and on behalf of those we are seeking to serve. And we know that there's a lot of pain in our world today. So may we this Lent pray for God to reveal to us where we individually and as a church are called to follow Jesus Christ and be willing to embrace the pain of others in our world around us, simply seeking to comfort it, to bring God's hope, to bring God's redemption, trusting that God in Christ is right there, working for and calling us to life. Amen. As we respond to God's word today, I'm going to invite you to uh, if you haven't already filled out your prayer concerns, go ahead and get those ready because I'll be coming around to receive those as we sing together, Living for Jesus. The words to that will be on the screen in front of you. And we're going to sing three verses. I uh, apologize to anybody for whom I left out your favorite verse. But uh, 